Well, as Tammy was saying, here we are in 2020. It is a year none of us will ever forget. We'll be telling our great, great grandchildren about it. And for most of us, it's been one of the most, if not the most challenging year we've ever faced. We're in the midst of a global pandemic that has wreaked havoc on our health care system, the care of our elderly and infirmed. It's almost destroyed our economy. It's affected everything, even the way that we are able to worship and gather as believers. On top of that, we have riots and destruction, the burning of our cities, looters, widespread fires, storms, and we're bombarded with bad news every day. More bad news, more destruction, more division, political upheaval. We're weeks away from a critical um, elect presidential election. And on top of that, we all have personal problems that we face. <coughs> Global problems don't, don't stop our personal health struggles. It doesn't eradicate cancer. It doesn't mean that we don't still have struggles in our marriages, in relationships, financial struggles. And all around us, there are people who are discouraged and they're frightened and they're depressed. And we need to learn how we can minister to these people because we have answers to give them. We have hope that we can give them that they will not find anywhere else. Now, you know, some of us are not as tender hearted as others. Maybe we're not naturally compassionate people. Maybe you're one of those ladies who's quick to tell those sensitive, depressed warriors to just get over it. You know, to, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and face this with determination and resilience. And to be perfectly honest, there have been times when I have been tempted to say to a family member or even a counselee, really? Really? You just need to get a grip on things. But I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit who controls my tongue and doesn't allow those words to come out of my mouth. Because that kind of counsel doesn't help anybody. It doesn't offer any hope. It doesn't do any good. And it certainly doesn't comfort them the way I have been comforted by my Heavenly Father. So, by nature, I'm pretty easygoing. I'm um, a laid-back kind of person. And when I was younger, I would struggle at times with, with understanding why people would choose to be all glum and down in the mouth all the time. Because that's how I perceived it. They're choosing to be gloomy instead of happy. Boy, we think we know so much in our youth. We think we know so much in old age, and we have so much to learn. I have several close family members that really struggle with depression. And in walking through that with them, I am learning to be compassionate. The Lord is teaching me to show compassion. And you know, that's what the Bible instructs all of us to do, is to show compassion toward others. I would like for you to turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Colossians 3.12, if you have a Bible with you. Colossians 3.12. Those of us who know the Lord should be extending a sympathetic hand as well as offering hope to the world around us. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, 
Now for the next few moments, I'd like for us to consider four small words in this text. Put on tender mercies. That seems pretty straightforward and easy to understand, doesn't it? One translation reads, put on compassionate hearts. We are to show mercy just as we have been shown great mercy. And this command is for all of us. It's even for the go-getters who have an agenda and expect everybody to get on board and get it done. It's for those of us who are steady eddies and don't let anything rock our boat. Nothing moves us. Nothing ruffles our feathers. But regardless of our temperament or personality, the scripture says that every one of us are to put on hearts of compassion. Back in June, I came to visit my parents who live in the area. And while I was here, I realized that it would have been my younger brother's 61st birthday had he not passed away when he was 20 years old. Just, um, just about six weeks after, I'm, I'm sorry, six years, almost exactly six years after he passed, we lost my baby brother at the age of 25. And that week, I was looking back over old photos on a hot summer day and an avalanche of memories flooded my mind. Another event happened that week that um, caused me to spend a lot of time reflecting as I learned that some friends of ours had a 30-year-old son who'd taken his life. And as I thought and pondered, I thought, what would cause someone to have so much despair that they would do that? Through lots of hours of counseling, I have observed that people can mask depression really well. They can cover it up. And some of the least likely people you would never guess are carrying incredibly heavy burdens. And very often it's imperceptible to others. Some of the most beautiful, wealthy, successful people struggle with deep depression. Um, some of the saddest people are often the class clown. They're the ones who make people laugh. They're the life of the party. Often they are the ones who always have a listening ear for someone else and a sympathetic shoulder to cry on. Years ago I had a friend who taught frequently in ladies conferences and on more than one occasion I heard her make this statement walk slowly through the crowd walk slowly through the crowd and it really touched me when she said that I thought of my brothers I thought of a close friend who appeared to others as though she had it all together she'd grown up in a pastor's home she had a wise and godly husband who adored her and four wonderful children they were heavily involved in our home church. She educated her children at home. And from the outside, they looked like the ideal Christian family. She was very outgoing. I mean, really extroverted. She was one of these women, you go in a restaurant with her, and she talked so loud, everybody would turn and look to see who was talking. And she laughed even louder than that. She was a good friend of mine, and I thought I knew her well. And then one day she confided in me that she had struggled with depression for years. That she had been on antidepressants for many years. And I was shocked because I never would have guessed that. I thought of other women that I've known through the years who have struggled day after day after day in very, very difficult marriages. Women who have lost children bound in the clutches of drugs and alcohol and sexual immorality. I thought of women I had met who silently carried false guilt from being molested as children. And you know, the list of pain and heartache that we have become so familiar with could go on and on and on. We never know 
what people are carrying around. And to this very day, those words walk slowly through the crowd, ring in my ears. Every day, we meet people who are dealing with suffering in one way or another. And if we take time to listen, it seems that everyone has a story to tell. No time in my life have I been more aware of this than in 2020. A lot of folks have experienced loneliness as we've been quarantined at different levels for almost the whole year. We've seen sad pictures of children or adults waving to grandparents or aged parents through windows. Um, many have struggled financially as nearly 73,000 businesses have shut their doors in the United States this year due to COVID, resulting in 20 million people losing their jobs. Many have struggled with things, various things in their lives because our lives have been changed. And even children are living in fear. They're wearing masks to school. Some aren't going to school. They're doing online school. And I have a little six-year-old granddaughter. Our youngest daughter has four children. And she homeschools the oldest one who's six. And so when I'm home, I try once a week to go over and do school with my little Phoebe Grace. And so last Tuesday, I went over to her house and I was doing school with her. And when she went to get our school books, she said, Grammy, I want to write in my prayer journal today. And I didn't know she had a prayer journal. I'd never done that with her before. And she brought it over to me and she said, every once in a while, Mommy asks me what I'm thankful for. And she writes it down. And then she asks me what I want to pray about. And she writes it down. And so I opened it up and I said, well, Phoebe, what are you thankful for today? And she told me. What do you want to pray about? And she told me, well, I began looking back through that journal. She's six years old, beginning in about late February, over and over and over again, her mommy had written what Phoebe told her to write. Dear God, please don't let my granny, which was my husband's mother, or my Gigi, which is my mother, get COVID. Dear God, please protect my granny and my Gigi and all the old people and don't let them get sick. It was on her mind. She was thinking about that. And you know, many of us have been frightened or uncertain or insecure, but not everyone has responded that way in 2020. For some, not that much has changed. They still have their job. They don't know anybody who's gotten sick. And they just have this idea, well, you know, we need to just get through this. We can get through this, and we can as Christians. But some people have a hard time showing pity, showing mercy, not just in 2020. It's been a lifelong problem. But, you know, the Lord will change that if we allow him to. He'll come, and he'll change us. I'm just not naturally tender-hearted is not an acceptable excuse because the scripture tells us all to put on compassion. The Bible commands all of us to be merciful and compassionate and that's what I want us to consider this morning. In verses 8 and 9 of this third chapter of Colossians, we're told to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, and lying. But the apostle doesn't stop there, and neither should we. When I was first saved, this is how I primarily thought about Christianity. My main perception of Christians was that they didn't smoke, they didn't cuss, they didn't go to movies, they didn't drink, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. And the, the scripture certainly tells us to put off certain behaviors. But we need to be careful that we don't just think about what we're told not to do. We're given a lot of positive instruction. And we're not only to put off anger and wrath, but we are to put on compassion and kindness. It's essential that we don't just refrain from hurting other people, 
but that we seek to do all the good that we can for others. One version says, be clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. We're to take off uncleanness, anger, and wrath, just like we would take off dirty clothes and lay them aside. And we are to take compassion and kindness and humility and love and put them on as we would put on clean, fresh clothing. It wouldn't be a bad practice each morning as we're getting dressed to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, would you please clothe me with mercy and tenderness and gentleness and love for everyone I meet. And the apostle gives us a good reason here why we should ask him to do that. He says, put on compassionate hearts because you are the elect of God. The Lord chose us not because of any good in us, but simply because of his extraordinary mercy. We are our Father's beloved ones, and as such, we should conduct ourselves as the special treasured daughters of the <coughs> Lord God. We were saved because he showed us grace, and as objects of his mercy, we should be quick to extend mercy to others. He gave his precious son to die for us. And so we should love him and love others by showing compassion. Now I want us to think for just a moment about that word compassion. It means suffering together. We are to show pity and the tenderest of mercies. Those who have been shown so much mercy should be merciful to others. Now the old King James renders this in an interesting way. It reads, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Now to be quite honest with you, I used to think that sounded really gross. <laughs> I'm not a poetic, sensitive kind of person, so I didn't really grasp the depth of the meaning in that expression. It's conveying a yearning compassion that is so deeply rooted in our hearts. We feel it in the depth of our, of our souls. It's genuine and it's warm. There's no hypocrisy or deceit. We're to be merciful not just in our actions, but in our spirit and in our affections. And it seems to me that all of the virtues listed here are working together. Think about it. Who are normally the most kind and compassionate people you know? Well, they're those who are humble and meek and long-suffering. And when we find ourselves really struggling to be sympathetic and gracious and patience, patient, we need to ask the Lord to examine our hearts. Because very often at the root of a lack of those graces is a heart of pride. It's a root of pride. If we're not seeking to grow in this area, it may be that we're looking down on others. We don't think they're as strong as we are. They're not as spiritually mature as I am. That's just pride when we see others that way. We have been commanded to show great pity and tender regard to those who are in distress. But practically speaking, what does that look like? Well, James 2, 15 and 16 tells us if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and you do not give him the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Speaking words of sympathy and passion, compassion is a good place to start, but it's a bad place to stop. I've often asked myself, how can I become more sensitive to the needs of others? And I want to share a few of those ways with you that I have observed. One obvious way that we can show compassion is to be accessible. I mean really accessible to people. Like many of you, I am busy. We wear a lot of hats. We're moms, we're wives, we're grandmothers, we're homeschool teachers, we're employees, we're employers, we're caretakers of elderly parents, we're busy church members, we're involved in community outreach, 
And frequently I find myself too busy and I have to back up and reevaluate. Far too often I have had friends or family members say to me when they need help with something, I really hate to bother you because you're so busy. And every time I hear those words, I feel a tinge of sorrow. Because I never want to communicate to my family or my friends that my schedule, my deadlines, my responsibilities are more important than people are. That's why we have the deadlines and responsibilities. It's for people. Um, now, I realize there has to be balance. We have important things to do, tasks that we have to complete, and we can't just sit around waiting for people to pour out their hearts to us. And there are people who will simply waste your time. They don't really want help. When they're given biblical instruction, they just disregard it. They're willful in their disobedience. They just want to ramble and gain sympathy and they waste your time. But many times, I need to just put my phone down, lay the work at hand aside, and really listen to people. Now, I'm, I'm not really perceptive a lot of times. And in recent years, I've come to realize that there have been numerous occasions that I have failed to detect the muted cries of women who have been asking me for help. One was a friend of mine who was being terribly mistreated in her marriage. Her husband was in full-time ministry. We had known him since he was a teenager. They were married for almost 20 years with four children. They traveled extensively. And there were times we would, they lived in Canada, so we didn't see them often, but there were times we would see them as she was dropping hints to let me know we're in desperate trouble in our marriage. But they went right over my head. Then one time I received a private message from her. And I was trying to read it and it was jumbled and it didn't make sense. And I thought, I wonder if my friend is having mental issues. Or maybe her account's been hacked and this isn't really her. And, you know, a lot of times when we're busy, I don't know about you, but I'll just read over my private messages really quick. And I'm like, I'll come back to that and answer it later because I've got to think about this. When I went back to reread it, re -read it, it was gone. And she told me much later, I deleted it out of fear that my husband would see it. Their divorce will be final next week. And I missed it. And there have been other missed opportunities when a friend or a relative trying to test the waters has attempted to let me know I am struggling with debilitating anxiety, with serious problems in my marriage or other difficult circumstances. And often their veiled pleas for help have gone undetected by me. Not because I didn't care, but because I wasn't alert, I wasn't sensitive, I wasn't really listening. So I'm learning to ask questions. I'm learning to listen more carefully. I'm a black and white, bottom line kind of person. And many times I have to realize everyone's not that way. Those of us who are more laid back and even killed, and those of us who have more of a type A personality, we're ambitious and we're impatient, we need to learn to listen. Not just to the words of people, but to their hearts and discern what is going on. Another way we can grow in sensitivity to the needs of others is to learn to emulate our Heavenly Father in the art of showing mercy. There is so much in the scripture about God's mercy. Just to name a few, the Bible tells us the Lord is abundant in mercy. His mercy endures forever. God is rich in mercy. He is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. I love 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. The Apostle Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble 
with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He is the Father of mercies. He is the God of all comfort. Isn't that beautiful? We want comfort when it's us hurting. But are we quick to extend it to others as our Heavenly Father does to us? He's full of mercy and He comforts us in all our trials. Why does He do that? He doesn't just comfort us so we'll feel better. He deeply loves us and He cares for us, but He also wants us to share that, the comfort we have received with others. Over and over again in the pages of Scripture, we read of His unfailing mercy and compassion. There are numerous ways we can express love and concern to those who are hurting. We can offer to babysit for a young couple that we know need help in their marriage. They need time alone to build their marriage. We can offer to relieve a friend who is caring for an elderly parent and give them a break. We can take a young mom or a struggling sister in the church out to lunch or coffee, invite them over for coffee, or do something with them that they enjoy. Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort to make a phone call or send a text. We all have those things with us all the time. To just send an encouraging text, but it can make someone's day who just needs to know that somebody cares. It's amazing how a bouquet of flowers, a home-cooked meal, a good book, or just a simple card can lift a downcast spirit. One of the greatest things you can do for someone who's battling depression is to give them hope. The Lord is not only the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, He is also called the God of hope. One of my favorite verses is Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This wonderful, caring father of ours doesn't want his children to just barely get by. He wants us to abound in hope. And sometimes he's pleased to use us in all of our weakness and frailty to encourage someone else to do just that. We can offer hope to others by praying for them and with them, quoting the promises of God to them. And of course, true and lasting hope is only found in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we must consistently point them to the scripture, to the gospel, the Savior who himself said that we might lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Lastly, I want us to consider the greatest example of compassion we have. If you lack compassion and gentleness and genuine love for people, I want to challenge you to read through the Gospels and mark every place where we're told that the Lord Jesus showed compassion. He was moved with compassion. Numerous times we're told that he was deeply touched when he saw the multitudes. He had compassion when they had nothing to eat. And he multiplied a few, a few small fish and some biscuits so they wouldn't get hungry. He had compassion on the blind, the sick, the unclean, and the sorrowing. He had compassion on the multitude because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In Hebrews 6, we're told that the Lord Jesus is our great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. And because of him, we're told to come boldly before the throne of grace so we can obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. If the sinless Son of God is so willing to show mercy to us, as sinful and needy and broken as we are, if our kind Father is so ready to grant mercy and grace to us, should we not be more than willing to extend mercy to others, to extend sympathy and grace to our hurting brothers and sisters. The Apostle John asked a very penetrating question in 1 John 3, 16 and 17. He said, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, 
and we ought also to lay down our life for our brethren. But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? If we say we're Christians and we have the capacity to help brothers and sisters in need and we shut that up, we hoard that up, whether it is our time, our resources, our sympathy, how can we say that the love of God dwells in us? In 1 Peter 3.8, we're commanded to have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. I love the account of the relationship with William Cowper and John Newton. William Cowper was an 18th century English poet and hymn writer. And at the age of 21, he began to battle paralyzing depression and despair. He had a very traumatic childhood. His life was filled with disappointment and pain. John Piper says despair came to be the theme of his life. He was admitted to an insane asylum for the first time when he was, I think, about 28 years old. And although he repeatedly said that he was damned, that he was beyond hope, there was a Christian doctor in that asylum who shared the gospel with him over and over and over again. One day, William Cowper was reading in the Bible, and he read the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and he wrote, I found so much benevolence, mercy, goodness, and sympathy with miserable men in our Savior's conduct that I almost began to cry. Little thinking that it was an exact type of the mercy with which Jesus was about to extend towards myself. God saved William Cooper, or the British say Cooper, William Cowper, but sadly his struggle with depression did not end at the moment of his conversion. He attempted suicide multiple times but God providentially saved his life, spared his life, and he sent a man who would become the most important influence in his life. John Newton was known as one of the happiest and the most beloved pastors in the 18th century. Just to give you a little idea of the character of John Newton, his personality, he said, if I had two heaps before me, one heap of human um, happiness and one heap of human suffering or misery. And I could take just a little bit from the heap of misery and put it on the heap of happiness. I would feel that I had accomplished something. He said, if I should meet a little child on my way and I picked up a half penny that another child had dropped and by giving that child a half penny I could put a, pile on, a smile on his face. I would have done something. He said, I should hope that I could do greater things than he did, but I would not neglect this. And John Newton was William Cowper's pastor for 13 years. In order to help him, he, taught, he spent hours talking with him. He drew him into ministry, into visiting with him. And as they would visit people in the congregation, they would walk and walk and talk. And he convinced William Cowper in 1769 to help him compile a hymnal because John Newton wrote over 200 hymns. Some of the greats like Glorious Things of the Earth Spoken and of course his most famous and well-known hymn Amazing Grace. Cowper wrote 68 hymns including There is a Fountain Filled with Blood and one that I love and often quiets my spirit when I am tempted to be troubled. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. Well, eventually John Newton left Olney where William Cowper lived and went to London to pastor another church, but he never abandoned his friendship with Cowper. For 20 more years they exchanged letters and he would come to visit. He continued William Cowper continued to pour out his soul to John Newton as he could to no one else. Newton was a faithful friend and pastor to Cowper for the remainder of his life. You know, ministering to someone who is severely depressed is mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting. 
But as John Piper writes, Newton did not despair of the despairing. And after one of his visits, Cowper wrote to him in a letter, You have been the shepherd who was sent to lead me out of the wilderness into the pasture where the chief shepherd feeds his flock. We owe John Newton a debt of gratitude for his investment, the many hours he invested in the life of William Cowper. Thanks goes in part to him for Cowper's rich hymns that we still love and are edified and strengthened through. Although John Newton was a busy pastor, he took time to pour into a hurting brother. And it wasn't just for a few days or a few weeks. For decades, he listened, he sacrificed, he offered hope, and he pointed him to Christ again and again and again. John Piper writes, We have good reason to hope that if we nourish the love and patience of John Newton in our church, the William Cowpers among us will not be given over to the enemy in the end. May the Lord be pleased to use every one of us to show that kind of love and kindness and mercy and patience with hurting brothers and sisters that he's placed in our lives, to encourage them and strengthen them, his wounded sheep, that he has placed among us. May we determine for the glory of God and the building up of his church and the glory of his name and the advancement of the gospel to walk slowly through the crowd.